step into the latest installment of our rebroadcast series, podcast number 72 titled, Understanding the Ongoing Threat of Terrorism and Warfare, Insights from Council of Time featuring Mike from COT Rebroadcast on the N Generation Project. Originally aired on May 15, 2024, exclusively on counciloftime.com. Please see link in description. This episode goes into Bible study highlighting eschatology amidst today's challenges. Join Michael from Council of Time as we explore these peculiar circumstances in this riveting episode. To understand more visit the Council of Time on their only official website linked in description. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction who simultaneously is seeking God's guidance. Your support drives our mission to guide individuals toward truth, sobriety, and preparedness for what is described in scripture as perilous times. Join our exclusive locals community for EGP family members and have early access to many cool things. Thank you for being a vital part of the success of the N Generation Project. Before immersing ourselves in today's rebroadcast podcast, episode 72 titled, Understanding the Ongoing Threat of Terrorism and Warfare, Insights from Council of Time, we wanted to take a moment to tell you about our new merchandise since we are not sponsored. We also actively donate monthly to Council of Time. We're also thrilled to announce our brand new line of custom-made clothing and merchandise, all designed by our talented in-house artist and photographer, Mr. Eddie. From stylish tees to cozy hoodies and fabulous accessories, each piece is crafted with passion and creativity. But here's the best part. Every purchase goes towards supporting our project. Whether you're a local looking to show your ongoing support with a monthly subscription or prefer a one-time donation through Ko-Fi, your contribution makes a real difference. Join us in making an impact while looking fabulous shop now and be a part of something meaningful. Your patience and understanding during our hiatus have been greatly appreciated, and we're sincerely grateful for your ongoing support. Stay tuned for an array of exciting content headed your way. And thank you for being an integral part of our community. Blessings to all. Good to see you guys this evening. Okay. I have to start just, you know, 15 minutes early. We have, uh, boy, still continues. Everybody is still continuing. Well, Matt, somebody, you guys were asking some questions about these barges, right? Hopefully uh, today answers your question. Now, it's up to you guys whether you believe this is by chance, coincidence, or whatever, right? It's, it's up to you. But I meant what I said last time. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. Last time somebody asked me, is he, you know, you think this is the last time a barge is going to hit a bridge? I said, it's not over. It's not over. Also, on the Russian front, they are preparing for some uh, different type of warfare. Now, I'm, I'm not free to let you guys know what, but I'm telling you right now, they're preparing for a different type of warfare. Everybody will, will echo this sentiment uh, in a few days as everybody else uh, gets in on it. Uh, I, I estimate maybe four days. Uh, you'll have folks who will have some insights. They will tell you guys, but they're preparing right now for different warfare here in the USA and unfortunately in Europe. These assaults, this coordinated plan, I'm going to call it, uh, it will continue and it will begin to escalate. As the seasons get hotter, it's going to become quite dangerous, very dangerous, right? Uh, unfortunately, now I have to give you this unfortunate sign. They are not taking proper steps with power grid. Sad to say they're not. Um, and because they're not, that's going to cause problems for quite a few people. Just letting you know that. They're, they're just not taking proper steps. Um, it, it's not, it's unclear if it's purposefully, uh, you know, purposed ignorance or, whatever the case is, but they're not taking proper steps for the power grid. We all depend upon the power grid. We do. And so during the hottest seasons, that's going to cause some 
difficulties. This is the year of consequence, right? If that's not clear uh, with some of these happenings that have been going on, there's also an escalation in this time of consequence. It will become more and more, uh, greater and greater, okay? And I share with you guys about that tablet, um, uh, the dream with the tablet, right? The plans they had that were numerous and that uh, how desperate somebody was trying to present the data on the laptop to the government and how desperate they were. And I happened to see it, and it was not good. It was not good. In fact, it carries on until December. That much, I know. Right? It was uh, pages and pages of data, plans, and unfortunately, it's happening right here in the USA. So they have the plans, they have theirs. Another question, somebody asked me, um, this was last week, I believe, and uh, somebody, asked, I think, was it uh, in Pastor Paul's show or something like that? But uh, I believe that uh, Pastor Paul, maybe in Pastor Paul, asked me, do, do I think Benjamin Netanyahu is going to back down or is Israel going to back down? And I said, no, there's only two, uh, one way that Benjamin Netanyahu is going to stop. And that's if he's taken out and, and you know. I'm trying to communicate this without stating the obvious, right? To get some folks prepared for the inevitable. You know and I know that the world wants whatever Israel is doing to stop. You know that. And so there will be some attempts and it will consume some people and it will happen uh, likely from an internal source. Tonight, um, it should be breaking either tonight or tomorrow that there is internal opposition, great internal opposition to Benjamin Netanyahu. That should break tonight or tomorrow. That will be followed by action. Right. Action. And yes, I'm aware of the Slovakian, uh, Slovakian prime minister. There are, there are numerous attempts that have taken place since the beginning of the year. Right. Um, all these are due to mistakes. The these countries that are involved in this are stakeholders in something that will affect them for the rest of their days. They're becoming desperate. Everybody wants to move forward in one direction. Uh, you still have old ideologies that the world sees them as old ideologies, which are clinging. They will attempt to silence all old ideologies. Right. Now for the biggest thing, and I can't revisit this until about another two weeks. All of us, all of us here in America, get ready to be backstabbed. In the worst case scenario, yeah, I did. It's it, in the most unlikely of places. Get ready to be backstabbed. We'll revisit that one in two weeks. All right. Just get yourselves uh, prepped for that. This concerns. Uh, a subject all of you know about. It concerns people all of you know about. It concerns a person all of you know about. Get ready to be backstabbed. Just get ready. You'd be surprised what pressure can do to people and how crisis will bring out the true nature of anyone. Get ready to be backstabbed. Get ready. Get ready. It will teach people to... Uh, you know, that they may not want to put all their hopes in mankind. But get ready. Get ready. Put your hope and trust in our unfailing Savior. How about that? All right. How about that? Get yourselves prepared for that. Also, these storms that are forming. Many people right now, there, there are places, and it was not forecast yesterday, but there are places receiving several inches of rain right now, unexpected, um, these conditions. And this is during a cool moment. Had the temperatures been up about 10 more degrees, 15 inches of rain these people would have seen in less than three hours. You know what that means? Imagine this summer. Hmm? Imagine this summer when things are hot and a storm forms. That heat is going to drive wind speeds straight through the roof. Heat 
the differences, that differential between heat and cold that drives wind speeds. Okay? This summer is going to be absolutely uh, out of control. It will be. Get yourselves prepped for that. Get yourselves prepared for that. We have problems as the wind increases. You know what? In the Word of God, it tells us about this. It does. It tells us about that. How the seas, the winds and the waves are roaring. Right? The Lord wasn't, he's not kidding. In order for the seas and the waves to roar, there must be high wind speeds. Right? Now, what do we see trending? Uh, going up, it's been going up ever since 2015. Every single year, wind speeds are increasing. Every single year. As wind speeds increase, right, so will the size of hail. Wind speeds and hail go hand in hand, just in case you don't know how hail is formed. Imagine a fan that blows straight up in the air. And imagine you drop a piece of water right in the middle perfectly where it stays balanced. So long as the fan is on high, that little piece of water is going to stay airborne, right? If you introduce dust and even more moisture to it, and let's say we freeze it up there, but the wind speeds stay constant, it holds that water droplet aloft. Then it will begin to accumulate with other, you know, particulates and more water getting bigger and bigger, right? It'll continue to do that until the item, whatever it is, that ice ball is too heavy for the wind, right? If you take popcorn and drop it on a fan blowing straight up, it may that popcorn may blow far away. You take a pearl, do the same thing, and the pearl's going to go down, right? If the wind speeds are higher, you can keep that pearl aloft, but it takes, you know, a lot of wind to do that. Hail is the same way. Hail is formed by updrafts, right? So you have these straight-line winds that coalesce at one point, and they start blowing straight up. When they blow up, they keep ice aloft, water high up in the atmosphere before it's rain is ice, right? When it, when it starts falling and it warms enough, it turns into water droplets, hits the earth. Hail is kept aloft, high up in the clouds by updrafts. These updrafts have to be relatively strong to produce hail, right? The stronger the winds are, the greater the hailstone is going to be. Wind speeds of about 80 miles an hour can produce 4-inch hail, 4 to 6-inch hail, right? Imagine what wind speeds going straight up at 140 miles an hour would do, right? Imagine what wind speeds at about 200 miles an hour would do. This should also give you uh, insight into what type tornadoes we're, we're about to encounter. We have not seen strong tornadoes. We've not. There are three more categories of tornadoes. There are two categories of floods coming out. Two different categories of floods. So people will hear some strange things like flood emergency, right? There are policies that have gone forward, right? With the weather bureaus. So they can rename these things uh, based on casualty rates. It's the first time that they've ever named or categorized anything and put a casualty rate uh, with it. So there are floods that are going to be associated with death. There are tornadoes that will be associated with estimated death. There are hurricanes that will be associated with estimated death. And in fact, many years ago, we talked about what I was calling a hypercane, right? Another category of hurricane. They have, I believe, they, they concede that on their systems, they have already entered in uh, uh, about six different categories of hurricane. Now, that should raise a big question mark in your mind. Like, okay, what is being perceived that anybody would need six categories for hurricane, right? New ones, by the way, new ones, six new categories of hurricane. Some of these hurricanes are not going to rotate like they've been rotating. It's almost like the difference between a typhoon and a, and a hurricane or something like that, right? Some of these storms are going to be weird. And this will be the year that we have the sustained horizontal vertices that have no name. And they will come up with a name for it. So imagine a tsunami of air rotating laterally. That is straight across, not straight up and down, 
across. And imagine that lateral vortice, right, forming a column of uh, rotating wind about, say, 100 miles. And imagine like a lawnmower. It goes right down to the surface of the earth and does just performs complete damage, almost like a jump rope type formation before it dissipates. Just imagine that. So people will see these lateral vortices in the cloud. They won't know what to make of them, right, until it starts to descend. And when it descends, you're talking about a lateral vortice with rotating winds inside of probably about 380 miles an hour. And then it slams into the earth or slams into the surface before it dissipates. Now, one good thing is that it will not carry on from, it won't keep traveling for miles. It's going to slam right to the ground, right? All that wind is going to be dispersed, causing massive pressure changes. One estimated thing they say it will, uh, uh, a biological effect will be the bursting of eardrums of anybody who is near that where it bursts unfortunately we have houses all over the place we have things all over the place now you add in the fires with some of these storms you add in these fires and you're going to double some of the activity that's taking place so imagine the storm formations we have now are not being disturbed by severe dry air with a fire it a fires produce nothing but dry air right and in vortices of, of flame. So you're looking at severe, dry, hot temperatures colliding with wet, cold temperatures. You're going to have an explosion of activity in between. This is going to cause brand new phenomena that we're not used to. And the reason why is the sheer mass of some of these fires. In normal cases, some of this fire will meet some of this, uh, th this moist air. And then it will, they start to nullify each other, causing this nulled area. N U L L E D, nulled area, where it seems like conditions are kind of windy, but not too bad. In this case, the heat is going to continue feeding, right? And the, the other moist conditions are going to begin to run out of their, their energy. So the heat and the dryness will overtake some of that moisture, where you're going to have high altitude issues as well as low altitude issues. You'll have a reversal of high and low pressure. That can that just wreak havoc upon the human body, right? It will. All of this will happen at the same time that the Earth is continually being bombarded and being overcharged with the sun's emissions. All this is uh, forming. Actually, all this is happening right now, but at a tiny scale, a very tiny scale. This year, we see the outbreak of such such things and that does not include the ocean we have some issues in the ocean uh, they will become uh, life altering for quite a few people is the easiest way I can put it I'm telling you guys about this so you can prepare so, so that you won't you know kick back on your front porch when you hear and, and then all of a sudden you're here on television you know two three thousand people died in a storm and you're confused and then two or three days later, it happens again, and you're confused, and you get frightened because you don't know the mechanisms within the storm. Now, of course, everybody will jump on the bandwagon and attempt to explain everything scientifically. And that's fine. But uh, get ready to face some very different conditions all over the Earth and all over it. This planet is changing at an accelerated rate. It is changing. And ironically enough, after all of this rain that we're going to have, I'll say it again, right after the water event, there'll be no rain. No rain whatsoever. No rain. I will attempt to explain all of this in some, in a presentation with some, you know, small, tiny, uh, minimal animations. But it's good to know the sheer scale, the energy can, uh, in, involved, some of the forces in the, in the interactions, in the dynamics that take place on, the, on those interactions, and the actual output, right? For example, the sun shot out six, 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 six bursts of energy, right? Six bursts. Six magnetic loops had burst and poof, right? 
we had this onslaught of energy coming to the earth. And it was quite strong, right? It was very strong. But our bow shock and the magnetosphere, it just so happened, were able to absorb just about all of it, except for some of the leaked energy that came far south, right? And it was a neat sight for some people to look at, but they don't understand what has happened. I mean, let me explain this. Every time we get hit by something like that, it takes a while for the magnetosphere to recover. They know that. So we're not fully recovered yet, just so you know that, right? It's almost like somebody, if they were to punch another person, it takes time for the body to heal from that punch. Then you can take another punch and treat it like the first. But if you have a punch followed by another punch and another punch, well, then you're in trouble. This is what we'll likely face because we've just entered into one of the peaks of solar maximum. Right, just one of the peaks. They anticipate, normally you have two peaks, and you can see this on the butterfly charts that people track between solar max and solar minimum, right? They're called butterf butterfly charts. That's what they look like on the charts. And they, they, when you look at these in comparison to what's been happening, you know, it's no big deal. But when you start to see the trending of this season as a different animal altogether, right? so... These coalesced spots on the sun, uh, they're going to become co quite concentrated. And we're going to have an emissions problem. Right? An emissions. Our sun is changing also. Also. Which is why I am, I am, I'm just incredibly, it's, it's a blessing that you guys have so many people out there that have a passion to study these subjects outside of mainstream science. Because in truth, now I don't mean to diminish any scientists out there. Right, But scientists haven't helped people in the slightest bit. They didn't warn people about the weather. They didn't tell people about these weather trends. All you guys have heard for the last 15, 20 years is global warming. Haven't you? Nobody told you about the weather phenomena. You have Christians who were trying to scream out that the weather is changing. Right? You did. You did. Uh, you may think that some people who never heard anybody else may say, well, Mike, you were running your mouth about it when nobody, when everybody was, you know, mocking you, right? They're not mocking now, but scientists are not saying anything. Not a word. Not a word. Not, not the freelance ones. Where, where are the freelance ones? Where are those guys? What about the UFO experts who know everything about ETs and other planets? You mean they know nothing about Earth? Surely, you studied history, right? You know what the problem is? You guys know what the problem is? It's not that people don't know. That's not what it is. They don't want to be embarrassed by being wrong. That's the problem. That's the issue. People, they don't want to be wrong, right? So until it kills someone, they're going to hold their tongue. Truth is, some people know the truth. But just like the Bible says, they're not going to divulge that truth. They never will. They won't. They're not going to do anything to jeopardize their lifestyle. Hook or crook, they're going to say whatever. Those people who, who, who pay them money for the shows they do, they're going to say exactly what those people want them to say. You operate at a great disadvantage. When you attempt to tell a truth, you do, you do. And it can be quite embarrassing. It can be for years. I mean, you guys remember when I first said that wind speed is going to be 125 miles an hour. You remember when I said temperatures will be, I'm, I'm sorry, temperatures will be 125 degrees Fahrenheit. People said, ha, 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 that guy's nuts. You remember that? They laughed at the, at quite a few things they laughed at, right? But what they don't realize is this. What I said back then, people should be prepared for now. But they're not. They're just not. There's no way to prepare, to mentally prepare, right, for these things in a week. You can't do it. So piece by piece by piece, because I trust what the Lord gives me. I trust his leading. Sometimes 
I'll be in a place and, and everybody else is doing one thing. I'm glad to do something else. Right? Because I'm interested. Listen, I will ask the Lord in a heartbeat. You know, people can't get caught off guard. One of my greatest concerns is that people will be caught off guard. Let me tell you where that comes from. If any of you guys have ever been in combat and you ever sat there and saw a village be attacked, both from the air, from the ground, and you hear children and families, and they're being ripped to shreds, right? You're declined. You're, you're refused orders for any type of assistance you may aid anybody in. You can't warn them. They're the enemy. But you see them absolutely decimated. Why? Because they had bad information. Because people whispered to them and say, you know, I think we're in trouble here. And other people who know everything would come out and say, oh, no, everything is fine. The authorities on the situation didn't know anything. The attacks come and you see people die. Why? Because they were not ready. Because they weren't prepared. You see children die. Why? Because their parents were not ready. And they let children play when they shouldn't have. They did not have a grasp of the season. They didn't. I don't want to see that happen to anybody. We're facing something spiritual. This UFO topic, right? And I won't say this, but I'll say this once until we revisit everything. We need demonstration for some more. But this UFO topic is a devastating topic. Just so you understand that. It is not some play topic. It shouldn't be interesting. Or it certainly should not be entertainment. It is a deadly topic. It's deadly. Now, it seems harmless right now. And it seems even, you know, playful sometimes. It is not some playful topic. It's not some harmless topic. It isn't. It's not. It is a deadly topic. And people are going to find that out when it's too late. We have an Antichrist coming. The Antichrist spirit is already in the earth. And it's starting to pick up traction, this spirit, everywhere it goes. It's converting every town, every place it enters into. It's converting everything. People aren't concerned about that. I give you a personal strategy. Try to hear what I'm saying. If you're concerned about your own life, you're not going to see anything ever. You're just not going to see it. You'll be taken out in the worst way. If you have a genuine concern for those you love, how easy is that? A genuine concern for those you love, you will labor to have things in order. You'll have an understanding that they don't need to believe like you do. You just need to act on your belief. Because when you act on your belief, you assist in the salvation of many. You do. Remember that. But if you're focused on yourself, you're not going to make it. You're not. What you see is not going to be clear. What you perceive is going to be skewed. The information you hold is not going to serve anybody, not even you. Why do you think people find themselves in these weird situations. Haven't you noticed that when you're thinking solely about yourselves, you make your situation worse? It seems like you fix it, and then something worse comes. Haven't you noticed also that when you try to help somebody else, at first it seems like you're doing it at great loss to yourself? Somebody has to know what I'm talking about. When you try to help somebody else, a genuine help, you do so, and it takes away from you in the beginning done it. But then having you noticed, if anybody dares to continue, if they dare to continue, then their help is real. See, help is not real. If we get hurt and we back out of the help, it's not real in the first place. To assist someone is a commitment within itself. It's not a deal nor negotiation. Or to anybody commit, they'll find out that once they get past that block that area where it feels like it's taken away too much from you. Once you get to the point where you say, you know what? Okay, it's at a loss, but I will complete this for the sake of that person. Once you do that, you involve your father. That's when you involve the father. That's when your work is real. Your work is not real at the beginning. 
Your work is real when it costs you something. You know what happens if you continue? You'll never lose anything because at the end of the matter, God will have given you at least four times more than what you started with in the beginning. But you have to get past that block where it seems like, because all of you should know this, that when you dare to help someone, the lip service of others is going to be against you. Hmm? You also start to lose out on things yourself. It also seems impossible. Once you commit to helping that person for the sake of that person, not so that everybody else can pat you on the back, but you're helping that person for the sake of that person, now you're doing something. And when you do that, your father is involved. You always have to get past a certain point. Then your father's involved when the work is real. Once your father's involved, at the end of the matter, because you're committed to it, at the end of the matter, you will have gained, never lost anything. That's why a lot of people don't know what gain is. They don't know what a return from the Lord is. You know why? Because they are strategically attempting to get some type of return from the Most High. Nobody is going to trick the Most High into giving them something like that. When your work is genuine, so are your Father's blessings. Huh? But it will always feel like you're working at a loss. It will always feel like you're losing something. It's always going to feel like it's not going to work. And you see, that is the test. That is the trial. Because commitment never backs down because something won't work. Commitment does not just go away because it looks unprofitable. No, commitment is commitment. Isn't it? Hmm? When you commit to something and you're people of faith, you're not just some average person out there. When you commit to something and you're people of faith, aren't you committing in truth? Yes. So we're not supposed to gain from what we commit to. We're not supposed to commit to something so we can gain. Our motivations should be real. When you assist someone, it should not be to get anything in return. You know what the Lord said? Give to those who couldn't possibly give back to you. Do good to those who wouldn't. You know, the Lord said that in the book of John. He did. He said, you give to those who cannot give back to you. He said, if you give to those who can give back to you, what, what thanks have you? He said, if you love those who love you back, what thanks have you? In other words, what good is that? Even the common person can do that, but your children of faith. Love those who won't love you back. What is the Lord doing when he tells you these things? Anybody tell me what he's doing? Anybody? Can anybody tell me what the Lord is encouraging when he tells you to love people who won't possibly love you back? Hmm? Can anybody? People want to be children of the Most High, correct? There's a saying, huh? Like father, like son. As a mother, so as a daughter. Well, if it's like father, like son, your father gave, he did. What have we given God in return for our salvation? Can we give anything back? I can't. There's nothing I can give God worth anything for him giving his son for me. Nothing. So God did what? He genuinely did what he did for us, didn't he? Huh? He did that out of a genuineness. He was not looking for repayment. He does not need anybody's worship. That's that new age nonsense when people say, well, you know, God needs worship. No, he does not. That's some, that's some devil's concept in the world. 
that they wrote books about a long time ago. They came from another book, The Brotherhood of the Serpent, when it says demons need the praise of people to be encouraged to do their dark deeds in the world. God is not like a demon. See how Hollywood can program people and they don't even know it. How many people right now, when I, when I just said that, about a God needing worship, how many people have heard that before? You heard that before, but you can't, you don't know where you heard that before, but you heard that before. How many people can relate to that? Huh? Like somehow you heard that before. Come on now, be truthful. If you heard that before, it's in your flesh. It's a natural part of your flesh. Your flesh is the rebellion against spiritual things. You're not here to do everything your flesh wants. That's why you have to have a born-again spirit. Once you have a born-again spirit, you're not operating by the lusts of the flesh. If you give the flesh room, it'll come up with all sorts of concepts. God does not need worship. I've heard ministers say, God needs you. No, he does not. He does not need any of us. He does, in fact, exist without us. He didn't need us. He loves us. There's a difference. Remember that. God does not need us. He loves us. He loves us. Somebody says God made angels to worship him. Nope. That's not what the word says. The, words, the word defines what angels do. It does. It really does. But don't worry. There, there are so many common sayings in the world, right? There are common sayings in the world that in the absence of any other word, we have no choice but to go with it sometimes, right? We have no choice. That's also a movie thing. God made everything with autonomy. Did you know that? If God made angels to worship him, listen to me closely. If God made angels just to worship him, then his work is flawed because Satan fell. Now, we know that's not true, don't we? And guess what the angel said? The angel said, oh, no, no, don't worship me. I'm just like you. Oh, see, that's what the angel said. And in the beginning of Genesis, what does it say? Man has become like us, knowing good from evil, unless he put forth his hand to the tree of life, he'll live forever. What? Man has become as one of us? That means you're just like those in the heavenly host, minus your mortality and limitations of flesh. Oops. See that? Do you see it? Do you see it? So people have come up with these Harry Potter concepts and trying to sneak them into the word of God. Right? Somebody says, Brother Mike, didn't the book of Ezra say the Father saying man will worship me? Yes, but you have to have that in context. You have to have, when God does what he does, right? Then all will worship him. Do you know why? Because all will belong to him. He said all, all of us are going to worship him when he does specific things. And when you look at that in the Hebrew that word worship is connected to something else that means freedom. So that means your freedom of worship that nobody's forcing you to. That means you're going to say, thank you, Lord. That's what it means out of your heart. That's another way of saying that you're going to say thanks out of your heart. Right now, when God says when he does these marvelous acts in the world, then all will know that I'm the living God. That's true. That's true. Because nobody else will be able to do what he will do. As far as God ha forcing people to worship him, no. He didn't do that. Nothing God does is by force. Nothing. Oh, see, people have, let, hear me on this, but, but don't, don't take offense to it. Mankind, on different levels, they love control. They love control, right? Now, a long time ago, a fight broke out. 
Man wanted to subdue mankind, and they utilized religious institutions to do it. Religious institutions became government. That government grew in hopes to be like ancient Rome. Do you not know? I'll, I'll tell you something about ancient Rome, and you have to read about ancient Rome to know this. That a person could walk from one country to another, and they wouldn't have to fear anybody touching them, looking at them wrong, saying anything wrong or anything else. If they had a specific seal of Caesar, do you know that? Nobody would ever touch them, harm them, do anything wrong against them. They could have no money and ask for anything, and everybody would give it to that one person. Do you know that? That was the power of Rome. Rome, in fact, subdued the world. They did. That was Rome. Rome fell. How did Rome fall? It began with Christianity. It began with the ejection of demons. And then Rome rebuilt itself. But it does not have the authority it once had. It tried but it doesn't have it. Nobody was able to achieve Caesar's authority. And it literally is called Caesar's authority. And they have books on Caesar's authority. And they want Caesar's authority. And all these experiments that you see in the world is an attempt to regain Caesar's authority. Any nation, uh, take America, for example. What is printed in the books that America is, the great what? Anybody know what it is? The great what? It's what people have said about it. But people named it. People who, the originators, right? Or, or let's just say people who were in the middle of it. They based America off Grecian philosophy, off the Romans, Egyptians. That's why you have the iconography. In America, it's just like Rome, it's just like Greece, and it's just like the Egyptians. You see it all throughout America. Why? Because we're based on that type, of different types of philosophies, right? That's why we have a Senate. The Senate began in Rome. Congress, all those things began in Rome. Now, all that began in Rome. And we mirrored, we mirrored the same construct here. We did that. We mixed in Grecian philosophy, right? Capitalism, those things. All these different isms were mixed into it. Why? Because they took away what was clearly corrupting everybody in a monarchy. And they took it all out, but they kept everything else, right? So in truth, this republic, is, the formation of this republic is what Rome used to be. Now, what does America rule? Everything. Correct? We do. We rule everything. Where did Rome make its biggest mistake? Anybody know? After the betrayal of Christ. And believe me, the Caesars. Do you guys know that the Caesars wanted nothing to do with the death of Christ? They didn't want anything to do with the death of Christ. That's in your Bible. They didn't want anything to do with that. But they could not help the spirit that governed them. Right? What happened? People became corrupted. It's what happened. And when people were corrupted, the institutions that the people ran became corrupted. Huh? See how that works? Isn't that something? Somebody says, Mike, are you baptized? If so, how old were you? I did not get baptized until I was, how old was I? I think it was 20, 20 years old. I think I was about 20 years old. Do you know why? I knew what baptism was. And I couldn't fully commit prior to the age of 20. And I fully failed after my baptism. I did. I knew what baptism was and it was very serious to me. It was very serious. Baptist, somebody says, is, is, is baptism a requirement? Well, if you believe in Christ, then you'll have an open show of your commitment. Baptism is something that a person must first 
realize what it is, right? And agree with it. Because you can't do anything you don't agree with and that thing be real, right? Hmm? You have to agree with it. Did any of the Gentiles, let, let me ask you this. You ready? This is going to answer your question. Did anybody ever receive the Holy Spirit without being baptized in the Bible? Yes or no? Now, not you folks here that's been here at COT for a long time. Not you. I'm asking this to the other folks. You guys already know. Did anybody ever receive the Holy Spirit without being baptized? Yes or no? And the answer is yes. That's right. They did. They did. Now, here's my advice. Here's my advice. Go find that in the Bible where people did, in fact, receive the Holy Spirit without being baptized is in the New Testament. And then I want you to read a little before it, and it will tell you all about baptism and what it symbolizes. See, baptism is a symbolization of something. But let me, let me share this with you. For those who find out what it is, because you should do nothing, you, if you don't know what something is, how can it be effective? Baptism is something that you agree to do. But if you don't know what it is, your agreement is already void. Okay? It's already void. So in the Bible is a description of what baptism is that a lot of people don't know. And when you read that, then in a sound mind, do what God leads you to do, please. Because what would happen to a person, right, if they were saved but they died right after being saved? Are they going to the pit? Hmm? Are they? No, they're not. Salvation is to believe upon the name of the Lord. To believe upon the name of the Lord is to believe what he spoke. To believe what he spoke is to agree with him. And once you agree and you believe in that act he did, you're saved, period. So long as you believe. If a day ever comes where you do not believe, you're not saved. Just so you know that. Okay? But so long as you believe, you're saved. Now, so what is baptism? What is that? See, because in the Bible, Jesus told one man, you go back and do what your priest requires. To another man, he said, go and be baptized. Uh-oh, see, you have, to, you have to break those down. You have to look at those. Because Jesus was in a place where people spoke multiple languages. Not all of them were from the culture of the Jews. And so you have to start looking at that, don't you? Hmm? You have to start looking at that. You have to see it for what it is. Men have given mandate after mandate after mandate after mandate after mandate. Because they want to be controllers over what God is doing. So I hate to say this, the same thing that's happening with the early Catholic Church. Right? Vicar of vicars. You, you have a person who believes that they are the voice of the living God here on this earth. And that they have been given all authority to enact all powers of Christ in the earth. That's what they believe. If that were true, there would be no foul root in that place. There would be no child molestation. There would be none of that. And the Pope would see everything. But we all know the Pope does not see everything. That the Pope relies on computers and research and lawyers and everything else just like everybody else. With the Holy Spirit, you do not need a computer. With the Holy Spirit, you don't need a lawyer. With the real Holy Spirit, you don't need that stuff. Man has, man has a replacement for the Holy Spirit. And some things look like the Holy Spirit. I can assure you they're not. The Holy Spirit will blow your mind twice. And then blow it up. And nobody is going to take the position of Christ in the earth. Jesus said, all who come unto me. He didn't say all who go to so-and-so who would then present it to me. No. He said, now we can go boldly to the throne of grace to find help in a time of need because of Christ. Not go through 50 people before we ever get to Christ, before we ever get to the most high. No. That all that is is a person who wants power, a system, because they want power. And sure, if you have an ideology, 
You can go and mix up a thousand different ancient writings to support your ideology. That's why I love context. Because when you have context, it will shoot down all this manpower stuff. Satan wants people to believe in their own divinity. Can't you see that? Satan's kingdom has been replicated in the earth, which is what Sue said, legalism. That is to speak as a dragon, is to speak by the laws. Satan catches, he accuses people. Think about this. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. What does an accuser do? If you have a true accusation, you know all the laws. You know all the do's and don'ts. Don't you? Huh? So Satan knows all the do's and don'ts, and just like a prosecuting attorney, he catches you on every technicality he can. Men love to replicate that. Think about that. That is having a draconian tongue. That is speaking like a dragon. A dragon will speak by those technicalities, those laws. Satan is interested in accusing you on breaking any given laws. Jesus came to forgive you of all of what you broke. Huh? Thank you, Lord. Isn't that something? Now, folks, be careful. Listen to me. My position is with the Lord. And anybody who comes alongside Christ, they have my support. My position is not with the institutions of man. It is not. And it never will be. It is with the Lord. Please know that. That's why I do not support these ideologies, endless ideologies in this earth that do nothing but rip people apart and set one over the other. The Father is no respecter of persons. All that stuff came from mankind. What is the difference between mankind and those who believe? You may be in the flesh as everybody else. But there is a notable change in everyone who believes in Christ to and who has accepted his sacrifice. His sacrifice. And when I pray, I pray directly to the Father. By the authority of Christ and no other authority. And I call upon the name above every name. I don't call on anybody else's name. But that name, Jesus. Now you know my position. It does not waver. It won't alter. It has cost me everything. And Jimmy Crack Corn. Now let's continue. I don't demonize men either. Because if they go astray, you know who made them go astray against Satan. I'm against the doings, these, these cultivated doings of mankind in the earth that are grotesque at best, that have never produced any good fruit. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Look at the world, will you? That's the fruit of the many roots. Want to keep eating from that tree, do you? No, thank you. Satan is the author of confusion. Wherever confusion is, Satan is a part of that. And Lord knows there is massive confusion in so many places. Somebody asked me, they said, well, what are you? Are you a you know, Catholic? Are you a Baptist? Are you? I said, I'm a believer in Christ. That's what I am. I don't carry in these subcategories, I don't. I don't do that. Some people don't like me for that. But I'm a believer in Christ. That's what I am. I'll never allow any system to make me cause another human being to be a target. 
I will never allow that again. I did that once. I'll never happen again. So then all those little forces that cause one man to go against another have failed in my life. Because I'll never again be a part of anything like that that would dare make me target another human being. Another human being that our Father loves and has given life to and indeed sent Christ to die for. I'll not target that person. That's what Satan is good at. Causing people to have a target. I don't have a target. To have a target is to have a person in this world you hate. I do not have a target. And I will not have a target. And if you look carefully in your life, you're going to find Satan has spent a great amount of time causing you to have a target. And if you don't believe me, if you, if you don't believe what I'm saying, then I want you to sit down at any given time and you say, okay, I do not have a target. I'm not against anybody. And you truly forgive everybody, even your political enemies. And watch, you don't have to tell a soul. You lock yourself in a closet and do it. It's not going to be 15 minutes. Somebody will approach you. Somebody's going to call you. Something is going to happen to try and make you blame somebody else. And if that one person doesn't work, here comes a crowd. I'm telling you what I know. Darkness does not like to lose real estate. So long as you have a target in this earth. Well, that does not come from the kingdom of the living God. You get rid of those targets and darkness will raise its head to get you to have a target again and again and again. You may say, where are they at now? Well, they're nowhere because you have a target. Because you have agreed with someone who had a target. If you withdraw yourself from all of that, then you'll see. The only time you can see darkness is when you step fully out of darkness into the marvelous light. That's when you'll see. That's when you'll say, yep, that was darkness. That was darkness. You guys bring up very good questions, too, and good points. See, because all these points and questions is something that people hardly don't go over. They don't. They just don't do it. Not by the word of God. Some of these smaller subjects, and you guys are supposed to help me on this. You know I'm a motor mouth sometimes, right? So things like baptism. I already wrote that down right now. We're going to have an important study on baptism. Now, before, before I go any further, too, I'm not some authority in the Bible. That's not who I am. I'm just like you are, right? There may be one difference, just one difference. And that one difference would be, I absolutely and totally believe in the words of Jesus of Nazareth. And I do not doubt anything he ever said. I don't question whether he's real or not. I absolutely believe. I also believe in the Father. And I trust his word. I trust it. I don't want it changed. I do not desire my way to be above his. I do not. I want his way to be in my life. I don't even like my own way. I'm always ready to forfeit for the sake of his word. I desire to surrender these ways of flesh and everything else for the king of kings and lord of lords. Now, some people may not be that committed. I've been in hard times. And I did not waver. I relied upon prayer. Not people. And God sent people by way of the prayer. Because he works through us. And because I absolutely believe. I absolutely do not like it. When some other spirit toys with his words of salvation. There is no other way the soul can be saved but through Christ. All these other ways are hurting people. How do you know if somebody's being hurt by the belief they carry? 
anger. A person can be free of all anger. All of it. Imagine that. Imagine something that made you angry one day has no power the next. Imagine that. You know what anger is? Anger is a consequence of us not getting what we wanted out of something else. If I saw a person, I don't like to see women and children abused. So if I see it, I get angry. Why? It's a consequence of me not wanting that person to be alive, to be able to do that. That's the truth. But can you see is still what I want? When you have the truth, then you see what the Lord is doing. You know, and even since that time, the Lord has been showing me some things, even about that situation, which won't even allow for a moment of anger. See, when you have absolute understanding and you see what the Lord is doing, how can anybody be angry? Somebody name me one situation you could be angry in and you understand and see what the Lord is doing. Can you name one situation? Anybody? I mean, honestly, can you name any situation you could be angry in if you knew what your father is doing? Suppose you lost someone who backstabbed you, right? You might be angry, but what if you could see what your father's doing, which is contributing to your deliverance, which is you see he broke that for a reason and you see that reason and that reason is good. How then could you be angry? Somebody will stab you in the back and you turn around and say, God bless you. You'd smile and keep walking. Right? Somebody says righteous anger? No. That's a man made term. Man cannot have righteous anger. There is none righteous, no, not one. See, here, here we go again with man trying to come up with something to exercise things of his flesh. How can man have righteous anger? And how dare a man compare himself to the living God? How can man compare himself to the living God? God's anger is more pure than our best days. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in that righteous anger. Angry people say that. If you want to be angry, then be angry. But sin not. That's what the Bible says. That's not righteous anger. If it was righteous anger, it would not have that small clause at the end, be angry and sin not. No, that clause is at the end to say, all right, you're going to get angry, but you better not act on that anger. Because if you do, you're going to be in the realm of sin. Mm -hmm. And by the way, be angry is not telling you, okay, everybody, it's you go and be angry. That's not what that is. That's a condition you find yourself in. It's like being scared. You're not trying to be scared. You may be startled. But somebody may say, hey, you might get frightened, but don't act on that fear. People with PTSD. I tell that to a lot. You may become startled. Do not act on that fear. Don't act on it. Look the fear right in the eyes, right there in that moment. Involve no one else and get hold of yourselves and put it down quickly. Refuse it entry into your life anymore. Stop dealing with any guilt that's pressed upon your mind when your creator has forgiven you of everything you could ever do. You focus on Christ. And yes, that means I'll talk to people who have PTSD who are Christians. Lots of them. See, they, they all have this one issue. It's very difficult for them to focus on Christ when they start remembering whatever moment it was that caused the problem in the first place. They deal with a lot of guilt. They feel like they're not going to be forgiven. In fact, they're believing against the vow of Christ. But Christ, Christ is under a command, a command he will not fail at. Remember when Jesus said, it is God's will that he not lose any of us. So who's been working in your life? Jesus has this entire time. Your Savior has been saving you. Always remember that. Some people say, well, the Savior, he saved me. Nope, he's saving you. That's why Jesus continually said, 
right? When you see Jerusalem encamped about by her enemies, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth what? Near, nigh. That means it's coming to conclusion. What is another giveaway? Huh? What is it? What did he say? Anybody know what he said? He kept telling people, don't give up. Run. Faint not. Hmm? He said, he that endures till the end, the same shall be saved. So you're in the process of salvation, which means your father, your father has sent his son to save you, which means that process of salvation is active every day of your life. Every time you think you messed up, every time you think you're counted out, the Lord is saving you. He refuses. It is God's will that you not be lost. When you belong to him, that's a big deal. How do you know if you belong to Christ? Because you knew about him and you came to him. Jesus said, all who come to me, the Father hath given me. And I will in no wise cast out and I will raise him up the last day. That means when you were young, you, you knew about Jesus. Some of us ran from him. But here's the funny thing. Even in the most sinful part of your life, when somebody started mocking Christ, you stood up something in you, rose up, ready to defend the Messiah. Come on now, somebody, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Some people were drunk, and somebody said something about the Messiah, and you rose up. You guys could be in a full-on argument right now. Somebody could come in and say the Messiah is not real, and every single last one of you would turn to that person and say, oh, wait a minute. That's how you know. And whether you can follow him fully or not, you do truly believe, and that's why you were hiding. How many shut their Bibles before they did something sinful? Huh? How many did that? Do you know what that is? That's when you really, really believe. When you shut that Bible to do something sinful, you really, really, really believe. Because a person who does not believe wouldn't even care about shutting the Bible. They would never take the Bible and put it anywhere else. I remember one time, right? I, I put the Bible under a pillow like you could hear. Like, you know, if I put it under the pillow, it, it can't, you know. Like it was a device or something. Who does that? But here's the fact, though. When you believe, you know that your father's aware. You have conviction before you go into sin in the first place. You're, you have to convince yourself to go forward with sin. How many of you did that? You had to sit there and have a conversation with yourself. Well, I have to do it. It's the only way I can survive is to do this crook thing. I know what's wrong, I know, but I have to. And then you go and put the Bible somewhere so nobody can see. That's when you really believe. See, that's why you believe now. That's why despite everything that happened in your life, nothing Nothing has been able to tear your faith down so far that you would not go to Christ. And by the way, you're in the last times. The Lord and Savior has been saving you the entire time. The entire time. He's never left. He's never abandoned his task of your salvation. Never has he ever done that. He never did that. And some of you, some of you go willingly. Some of you go kicking and screaming. But the Lord has his way to cause you to see truth. And I have a confidence, one great confidence in one thing. You know what it is? See, I have this confidence. It gives me great hope for those who believe in Christ, no matter what their status is. Here it is. I know that when a Christian honestly sees righteousness, they run to it. I know that for, for many Christians, they have not honestly seen righteousness. They have seen tricks. They have seen ploys. They don't know what to trust. But I do know when they see righteousness, they run to it. They connect with it. 
See, that tells me that when Christ truly manifests, all of us will bow. All of us will be relieved. All of us will be ready to embrace him and everything about him. See, because even the Lord knows that if you saw the absolute truth, you would absolutely be his. But this walk, this process you're in now, must be by faith. It must be without seeing. It must be without proof. It must be because it makes it authentic. You haven't seen Christ. Everything you're doing when you do it in righteousness is by faith. It really is. Nothing has been absolutely proven to you. And you know what that means? When you have to do something by faith, it means you truly chose it. Do, do you guys understand me? That means you truly chose it. So you have to really choose something. You can't see to be loyal to it and to continue to be loyal. You must absolutely, by the heart, choose it. You're living in a world that's against most things of faith, that perverts the Holy Word of God, and it has not been enough to make you turn away and never come back again. Are you kidding? You're choosing Christ with everything that happens. I have that confidence. Every sinful moment you've ever been in, when you found out what it truly was. I'm going to say this, I'll take a break because Robin said that twice. But for every, tro for every bad situation you've been in, right? Every dark situation, doesn't matter what it was. When you were in that situation, it hit you. This is terrible. And when you saw it in its fullness, now what is seeing darkness in its fullness? It's when you feel the consequences of that darkness. When you actually feel the consequences of that darkness, all of you have said the same thing. You know what that is? You said, I want nothing to do with this. In other words, when you saw the truth of darkness, that's when you said, I don't want this. Many of you thought parts of darkness were light. And you may have said, hey, this is great. But when you saw the truth of it, you said, I want nothing to do with that. That's what you said. In every case, that's what you said. Some of you are still locked up in sinful things because you have not seen the fullness of that darkness. But every time you see the fullness of the darkness, which is also to taste the consequences of it, you say, nope, I don't want this. When you see what it does, you say, nope, I don't want it. When you find out it murders, you say, nope, I want nothing to do with it. You do that every time. You're choosing light every time. Now, you cannot choose the light over the darkness, unless you're immersed in the darkness. Now you know why. You're put here in this world where Satan is roaming all over the place. Now you know why you have to be exposed to so many different things. Because God works in truth and honesty, and you are honestly choosing the Lord over the darkness. And sometimes that darkness will come with little perks, and you have turned down the perks. Because you were truly disgusted by it. See, if you were truly dark, you would have ran to it, embraced it, and never left it. That's not who you are. When you see the true identity of darkness in each and every case, you say, no, I want nothing to do with it. That's how you know you belong to Christ. And this process you're in, it will be completed. Hmm? It'll be completed. Can't you see the process? This earth is a crucible. Your life is a crucible. This is a necessary process. Every day, every day that you're in this process is important. Every single day. Every single day is important. So long, so long. As you continue to say, thank you, Lord. So long as you continue to go toward the Lord. It doesn't matter. Can't you see now it does not matter how many times you turned away. 
It matters what you're going back to every single time. Can't you see that? Because when you see the fullness of darkness, that's when you let it go. I've seen people go back and forth because they have not seen the fullness of the darkness. But when they see the fullness of it, when they see the truth of it, they let it all go. They do. They say, I want nothing to do with that. That's why, that's why I don't condemn people. I understand that process. That's why. There are people who are ex-witches, warlocks, and everything else because they did not know what they were in the middle of. And when they found out, they said, oh, no, Lord, help me. Help me. Because they did not know what they were in the middle of. And when they found out, they said, oh, no, Lord, help me. Help me. Somebody said, how do you discern your own thoughts from God's next steps for you? Well, first of all, I don't have steps for me. I, I really don't. I don't have steps for me. I know that in the Bible it says God is love, right? It says God is love. So listen, if I am being edified through something, I know it's not of my father. Normally every step I take is of sacrifice and it's true, right? It takes away from me. Plus, I like to give. Whatever God gives me, I like to give back. So if I'm going to gain a bunch from it, I know it's not from the Father. He said he would sustain me. But people who are looking to be sustained all the time can't see what the Lord wants them to step. And also, I'm not consumed with my own thoughts. I do it. You know how you meditate on the word day and night? Let me tell you how that happens. Is when you go through life and you have your daily course, like after I talk. Do you guys know that after I talk, I will sit down with the Lord and say, okay, Lord, now this, this, this part now, please tell me I didn't go too far. And I will go in the word to go find out because I feel I just botched everything. All right? So I think about things. I think about your comments. You guys have the most beautiful questions, comments, and everything else is just, you, you don't understand what it actually is. I'll go over some of those things with the word of the Lord. And I'm thinking about his process, even in your lives. Through that thinking process, when I'm thinking about God's word and how it, how it works in your life, right? And I'm thanking him for the progressive steps many of you are taking. And I'm praying for some of you guys because maybe you can't quite get something. And I always take the blame for it. I say, Lord, they can't get it because I don't know how to talk. I have to be, I have to communicate better. Help me do this. Help me do this. Help me communicate better. And I put myself in your shoes. Sometimes the Lord will open up a window. It's almost like I can see your life. And I can perceive from your point of view. Because if I can't do that, I'd be a cruel person, right? I would. So I'm always, I'm always wanting to know what the Lord desires from me on your behalf. That's what I want to know. I don't want to know anything else. I'm, I'm being real. I don't want to know anything else because I found everything else to be unprofitable for my soul. See, because listen, I know the time is coming and what we're facing. I know that one day the whole facade is going to fall off in the floor. I know that man is going to stand up knowing he's a created being from the living God. When that truth hits mankind, some are going to run and hide. They're not going to be able to face the most high. I don't want to be those people who has worked in in some unauthentic place? No, I'm not going to be that. I want to be authentic and true to the Most High. Does that make sense? I'm concerned about what the Lord thinks. I'm concerned about my own personal authenticity with this word. I know I'm not worthy to handle the Bible. I'm not. It scares me to pieces because it's a holy word. And so I search through it. I, I never want to go too far with the word because it's holy, right? That's a holy word. I have a high regard for his word, which is why I don't sit there and swap it, change it, and do all that. And I, I'm not the person for that. All these different interpretations and stuff like that. No. So I'm interested in what the Lord wants. I don't ask. The one thing I never do is I don't ask the Lord, well, Lord, uh, you know, lift me up in this area and that. I don't do that. 
My focus is on my brothers and sisters. He really is. Here's what I found in life. Since God is God, if I am willing to pour out, God will always be willing to pour in because I believe in God. If I ever become a storage bin, the Lord will not pour into me. He will never pour into me so I can just keep it. He pours into me so I can pour out. Now, when I'm, I mean everything. I mean everything, everything, everything. I'm not put here on this earth, right? To, 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 just for me to grow. Do you know how, how devilish I would be? I'm just talking about me. If I outgrew you. That's not supposed to happen that way. You know, I looked in the Bible at the Levites, the priesthood. Do you know they had no inheritance with anything? I can see why. They would handle the word. The people were the benefactors of the word. And the, and the priesthood would devote their lives to the Most High. And they were so consumed with the Most High that everything went through them to the people. I looked back at the tithe. I did. And the tithe... Right? A tithe would be collected and people would take that to the place where the Lord God would place his name. And that would go all back out to the people again. That's what God means by when he says, let there be meat in my house. Because whatever's in God's house went out to the people. And if you notice in the Bible, people had altered that. And they became fat off what they collected. Which is why Jesus went into the holy granary and just messed all that up. They got angry. But the Son of God did not, did he? Did he? See, because God doesn't need a bunch of grain. God does not grow on a wheat farm anywhere. No. Why would he have people collect anything? So that his house would be a contributor to the people would be that place where if the people ever needed, they could go to the house of the Lord and they could get it. It was theirs. That's why it was not the pre it wasn't the priest to us. It was the people's. And they would take the best that they had. And they would bring it all into one place and they would have a feast. They would. But there wasn't just one tithe. There were seven. Seven different times of giving, and they were quite specific. You can do one without the other, and you can do any of those without that year of release. And the very first thing God told them was to owe no man no money. God's the one that broke their debt. Do you hear me? God broke the debt. Do you hear me? God did that. He broke the debt. And when the debt was broken, they took the first, the, the tenth, a tenth of their first increase, the best of the best. And they give it to God. Why? For the sake of all, out of obedience. But where did it actually go to? It went to everybody. That's what goes to everybody. These ministries we have today, God bless them. Do you know, do you know what these guys have to pay to, 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 to do that? And then you have folks who actually do things like give out free Bibles, right? They do like, like, like they get Bibles and they get blankets and they're always doing something, always putting something together for the people. But you may not know a lot of those true ones out there, they're suffering. They don't look like they are, but they are. They do without a lot. They may not look like it, but they do. And the ones who just talk about philosophy, they're getting rich like you wouldn't believe. And they're on television. They're the other ones on TV where all the stars go. But you have other ones. If you were to see what they were doing, you would say, my goodness, that's risky. That's risky. Somebody says, Pastor Paul, he seems so sincere. He is. We're all human beings. He's very sincere. He's extremely sincere. See, I have an understanding that people, people are just people. God makes a change in people. 
and people are called to things. But I'll tell you something. I do not doubt what the Lord shows me. If God ever shows me someone, I already know who they are. And it never fails. They turn out to be exactly who God said they were. Exactly. And you'd be surprised. See, that's why at the beginning of the year, I told you guys something, didn't I? Didn't I? I said, don't let your pastors go under. Don't let them go under. Don't let them go under. When Jesus was walking and he was talking about the gospel, people tried to kill him. Why couldn't they get to Jesus? Because of the people. That's why. It's because of the people. It's because of you. You're the wall that evil people can't get through. You're the reason plots don't work. You're the reason. You are, and you have been all this time. Somebody says, where do we listen to Ring of Fire live with that? She's, she, her link is on our, uh, her link is on our site, the Ring of Fire. Now she's on there from time to time. You'll have to go to her site, the Ring of Fire, R-O, what is that? It's on the site. Don't ask me for uh, an actual link, guys. It's on the it's on our website. It's on our website, and you can find that out there. You can find that out there. I'm going to put a link to her site on our uh, on our new format piece on our page too, and some of you might pop up in there also. You might, but folks, listen to me. I'm going to take a break. I'm taking a break, but. When it comes to authenticity in God's word, the one thing nobody should ever do is never assume you see the whole picture. Because you don't. There are lots of people out there suffering. Many of them are pastors. They're suffering big time. And you'd never know it. You'd never know it. I can also say this, right? You will not have these people that are speaking about the living God, you won't have them for as long as you think. They won't be on earth for as long as you think. They won't. And you can't do anything when they're gone. Can't do it. So, be back in a minute. Somebody said, Michael is four foot nine. (laughs) My boot is. No, I'm a little, a little taller than that. I wish I was. I'd fit in a certain aircraft. No, then my career would have took a, another turn. No, no, thank you. No, thanks. You know what? Right now, right now, listen, I have a sore on the top of my head, right? From a door. You guys know those signs they put in the, uh, the little uh, coffee shop things, right? the little signs they put and it was hanging below the door. If you get used to ducking something, like going into your garage or or, or going into a specific door in your house, right? You, you're good to go. You're good to go because you get used to the height. You go somewhere different and you'll misjudge it. That's what I did. And that was metal. Yeah, somebody says bells. Well, it, it's, a, it's a sore up there, right? I mean, it... It really hurt that. It hurt the top of my noggin. Probably while I lost my hair prematurely. Probably. Folks, I'll be back in a moment. Oh, oh by the way, you see you guys in Mixler? Look what you're talking about. These Those inquiries think up a way that COT can serve everybody better through the consolidation of those common things that you guys these requests that you have what you think or where you think something should be that matters that's what i'm looking for right listen because we're on a fast track now that means everybody's involved everybody's involved those things matter they really do employ me employ me 
Well, I can be employed, right? Well, I have my senses. Employment. I'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT. Listen, the world is uh, is is uh, sliding off the deep end. And I hate to say this, but terrorism. Terrorism is has taken a brand new turn. I certainly don't want you guys surprised by some of these other tactics. I want you to be, you guys to be aware of something. I want you to be aware of something. Now, but don't become frightened. There's some things I can't tell because people get frightened. They get frightened too much, right? You shouldn't get frightened. Have an understanding that nothing can happen outside of God's absolute authority. Okay? Make sure of that. Make sure of that. Somebody said, uh, my God loves marriage. Would he ever remove a spouse? If the spouse was doing something wrong, non against a praying spouse, would God ever put a couple on the path of divorce if one of them was so deeply sinning? Can I answer that when I get back? I have an answer for that. I do. I have an answer for that. Now, people may not like my answer to that uh, marriage question, but I have an answer for that. I have an answer. I feel strongly about the answer I'm going to give you. So I'll be back and I'll answer something about marriage. Would, would God ever remove a spouse from another spouse, right? They're nonviolent. They're not violent. They're not hitting anybody or anything. But uh, would God ever put a couple on a path of divorce? If one of them was deeply sinning, would God ever do that? That's the question. So if one of them was like, you know, going deeper into sin, and the other one was not, would God ever separate the two people, right, in a marriage? So I'll answer that when I get back. I'll do that when I get back. I'll be right back in a few minutes right here at COT Channel Zero. There's no music on Channel Zero, so uh, not yet there isn't. Uh, but we'll, we'll get that fixed up, guys, with the music thing. I'll be right back in just a few minutes. All right, everybody, I'm back again. So the question was about marriage. Are you guys, are you sure you want this answer? Are you sure you want this? Oh, I'm reminded about something, too. Here at COT, the tech bought this to my attention. Our tech's name is Mike, by the way. He's Mike, too. But, but hear me on this. There were so many times after that dream was shared with him concerning Pastor Paul that he would point little things out. Things that there's no way Pastor Paul should know, right? Call it intuition, call it what you will. But I've noticed how the Lord works with this. The Lord will take a person, and when he puts a person forward, the, they, they all, it's always, this. the people operate. Now, I don't know this about Pastor Paul, so I can't, I don't know this one thing, but I'll say this. I can almost guarantee that Passball works under some pretty tough conviction, right? Because there's no way any person on earth would have hit right on the head. These comments he'll make from time to time, which actually expose people, which is so funny. That's some funny stuff. It's funny, but it shocked the tech a few times. I mean, it really shocked him a few times. He Now, if you guys will ever, ever listen to some of his broadcasts, he'll make a big point. But I'm not talking about the big points. I'm talking about what he'll say. He'll, he'll say something and just keep saying it to get to the big point. But it's in that thing he'll keep saying or that he has said that leads up to the big point. He's exposing things that he, I don't think he knows. Right? He's ruffled some things, some feathers from time to time. But the tech caught a few things, and it is quite astounding. He even named a name a couple of times. He did. He named it. I don't see how anybody could ever do that, right? I don't. Now, some people could probably miss that because they want to hear specific things. But if you hear the whole thing, uh, it makes no sense. I mean, it does spiritually, but it makes no other sense. It doesn't make sense any other way for somebody to put something together. No. Anyway, okay. I thought I'd say that, right? 
So maybe some of you guys said, when you're listening to Passball, listen to the whole thing. Listen to the whole thing. You'd, you'd be shocked. I think you'd be surprised. Especially if you can remember what he says is, is quite, uh, it's quite astounding. It's quite astounding. But follow me on this, though. Divorce. Now, you guys, you, do you want this answer? How many people want the answer to this question? The question was, if a person is going deep, deeper and deeper into sin and the other person is not, would God make a pathway to divorce? And that's the question. Do you guys really want that answer? Should that be a private answer or should I just address it across the board and take the heat for what's coming about to come out of my mouth? It did stir me a bit. Right? It's not going to be what you expect to hear. I can tell you that. So let me start. I'm going to start. I need to ask you guys a question, though. Would God ever, does he ever, does he ever, does he ever authenticate a lie? Yes or no? Does God authenticate, does he make a lie? Will he make any move based on a lie? Will he? My answer to that would be no, he would not. So here it is, here it is. In the commitment process of a marriage, because God sees those two people as one flesh, they effectively become one. But at the beginning, there are some scenarios. For two people to become one flesh and to take a vow under the living God, it must be bound within truth. It cannot be a lie. So, If a person does not really commit to another, there's no way in the world they can ever, in front of God, commit any vow. God would not accept it. There is no vow. There's only earthly paperwork. It's a falsehood. God is not concerned with it. He's not even there. Right? He's he's just not there. So that, in my opinion, that's going to avoid half the commitments ever. Because people have gotten together. There was no commitment. There was lust. And a person wanted that other person so nobody else could have that person. There was some, you know, alternate reason, but there was no commitment. And you may ask, well, okay, what if two people really love each other? Well, then if they truly love each other and they're ready to commit one to another, right? Then they can take a vow before the living God. We're not talking about lust. We're talking about to really commit to this other person until death do you part. And they really take that vow. There is no divorce in sight for them ever. Number one, that's when they truly commit. But what about the other cases? Somebody may say, well, what about the people who had these preordained marriages? You can still commit. If two people that don't know each other, if they were put together, but in their heart of hearts, they truly did commit to this other person, they can take a vow before the living God. Why? Because they truly committed of the heart. But here's what I'm telling you. Most people do not truly commit of the heart. They just want something. And they go along with what the world does. And there's no commitment in them. Now, God knows what is true and what is not. And so some people's vow that they took was under false pretenses. God does not operate under false pretenses. He operates in truth. That's what happens. Because, now now with the commitment in mind, if two people are truly committed and one of them gets worse and worse, why should the other person ever expect to escape any darkness? Here's what will happen. So let me share this with you. If a person is truly committed and a person goes deeper and deeper into sin, right, but they were committed under God, then God has a part in that marriage naturally. And because he naturally has a part, his hand is in it. If that other person goes and starts sinning, God has already given power to the other half to intercede, to also cover the whole thing, and this other person will come back because God's in the middle of it. If God puts two people together, he is part of it. He is part of it. He will see those two people as one flesh. You have your spirit and your flesh. They do war against one another. You want to do something good, but your rational mind says, oh, no, don't do it. You don't have time. But you're in your soul. You want to do it no matter what. But your rational mind is fighting. It's the same thing. So why would a person cut themselves in half? 
When you're committed, you're committed. And if you're committed before the Almighty, the Almighty is involved. But what I'm telling you now is there are a lot of people who have been somewhat seduced, and there are some who have never committed at all. They've just not done it. They've not committed at all. Now, the seduced people are the people who are ready to commit, and they are committed, but they've been talked out of their commitment by some external force. That's no different than being lured into sin. No different. That's no different. If a person is hitting the other person, how can that person be committed to the other person, period? Huh? There's no commitment there. That's a person who wants to have the other person, to control the other person. That's not commitment. That's not what that is. See, because two people who are committed under the living God are going to have godly values in them, whether they, you know, expected that or not. If God is at the foundation of anything, you're going to have properties of the living God in that thing. But what I'm telling you is that people think they get married by a piece of paper that the Priests or whoever can say anything, but in their hearts, they, they're saying other things like, yep, let's go party right after this. We got the paperwork out of the way. Let's go do what we do. They're not concerned about commitment or anything else. So if somebody is sinning, but if you're committed, don't let somebody talk you out of that situation. That would be like cutting yourself in half. God is at the foundation of it. If the other person slips, right? If the other person slips, but you are committed, I'm telling you right now, your father has power and he's in the middle of that situation because of you. Now you're the good half. Think of yourself as the spirit and the other person as the flesh. What are you going to do? You're going to cut yourself in half? Hmm? Now, so... What if the other person was never committed in the first place? And people are just going through the motions. See, that's how people get themselves ensnared in an earthly situation, bound by something external. There's no commitment to God. It's just darkness. Much of darkness. But I'm telling you right now, don't let anybody seduce you out of running away. Because here, listen. If you are committed and this other person is sinning deep into sin, but they still love you and they're somewhat committed, God has already given you a type of authority to intercede in that. He sees you as one flesh, not two. So what does that mean? In normal cases, the person who is slipping into sin, right, or is backing away or doing something else, there's a loss of communication. There's a loss of prayer from the one who actually believes. Or the other person could have opened the doors to something that shouldn't be in there. If God is calling one to a higher level, here it is, listen. If God is calling one of you to a higher level that both may benefit, then the one that's being called to a higher level cannot do what they've been previously doing. They have to go to a higher spiritual level. You're dealing with new devils who will slip into the cracks where they did not slip in before and get to the weaker vessel. Don't let that happen either. Here's my advice. People know if they committed in truth or not. They know that. And yes, in the Bible it says that if two people are together, one's a believer, one's an unbeliever, and the unbeliever wants to go away, then let that person go, but do not go back into marriage again. Don't go back into a relationship again. Now, Paul said he wasn't given a new commandment. He was, he was doing that for the sake of the people. Because of the times, because of the wickedness of the times, just like they are now. And I'm telling you right now, it's not some commandment, it's not some, it's not going to be found in the Holy Word. But half the people who are married did not commit in the first place. Under false pretenses, they joined together. And you're, the father's, how can he be involved or how can he have somebody officiate something under false pretenses in truth? These little sneaky contracts and things like that. No, it doesn't work like that. God works in the realm of truth. In truth. 
People get together because of lust. People get together because they don't want anybody else to have the other person. People get together for weird reasons. Some truly get together out of commitment. And if commitment is involved, the father is too. The father is going to be involved. He will lead, guide, and instruct one of the two of them for the sake of both of them. God doesn't just hear one person's prayer and separates the other one. No, he sees you as one flesh. He will deal with you as one flesh. You know what that is? That's a telltale message to everybody who is married that, hey, stop running away. Be committed because God is going to see you as one person anyway. You can't. You can't sit up there and do something against the uh, the other person thinking that in God's eyes, that's going to be the other person. No, that's you too. If he sees you as one flesh, you're inseparable in his eyes. But if if one, under false pretenses, is was never there in the first place, it was, how could there be a commitment before the living God? And never run away from one to go into the arms of another. If God sets you free from a situation like that, don't jump to the other. Here's why. You ready? Now, let me give you the part you don't want to hear. If you're separated from one person who jumped, who was evil and doing everything else, because you met somebody else, that same evil is going to leave the previous person and go to the new one you're with. And the evil is still going to find you and confront you. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I've seen too many people go through. They think they're escaping one thing. So they jump into the arms of somebody else. And that same evil gets into the new one. So now what are they going to do? Do the same thing again. They jump out of the frying pan into the fire. You're dealing with spirits who have gotten in somehow. In some cases, you'll have a couple that's together, and it's a very good marriage, but they forget about the living God. They forget about prayer. They start slacking on reading. They're not building up the relationship in the Lord. They build it up in entertainment and everything else, and they slip away from that center point of the Most High. Now, one of them is trying to desperately get back to the living God, but they grew outside of it, and it becomes very difficult to do that. Is that not, though? What anybody does in life, that's what a pastor does. A bunch of people who may have slipped away from the living God, that pastor labors for the sake of the people. Hmm? For the sake of the people. And that's something. God works in the realm of truth. People have done things under witches and warlocks and everything else in this world. They have gotten together. They call it marriage. But I can almost guarantee it's not what the Lord would have sanctioned in the first place. Some people have gotten, got, just gotten together with somebody else just for the, for the weird reasons, for lust and everything else. And then when that's fulfilled, they're ready to go. And of course, a great many were never committed in the first place. But I'm telling you this, that if two people who don't even know each other can see each other for the first time, and by the heart commit to the other person god can be right there at the foundation of that if their commitment is real then the then that's a marriage that's a true joining of people but if but listen marriage means the joining of two people into one so if one of them is false there's no joining of two people into one that never happens it may have that appearance but that's not what it's going to be And some people have locked themselves in an earthly contract. Now, we'll tell you what the Lord said. The Lord said, or or the Father said, if he cannot trust you with an earthly contract, how can he trust you with any other promise or anything else? Think about that. Think about it. See, because when you separate from somebody, don't ever take it so lightly. The world takes that so lightly. Haven't you noticed that, that this world is not really based on commitment? Until somebody really wants something. When you go to the Lord. Follow me close on this. Suppose somebody wants a release. But the other person's not violent. They're not violent. And both you guys want a release from each other. And it's turning sour. You got to really ask yourself. You got to really come to terms of truth. You have to. You're going to have to go back to the beginning stages with the Lord. 
You're going to have to. You're going to have to be real in every way. No deceit, no lies with the Lord. You're going to have to rediscover the foundations all the way up to that very day. Some repenting may be involved big time. Then you're going to have to tell that person, you got to tell that person the truth. Don't just walk off without saying anything. Tell them the truth. The truth, the truth, the truth. There is no way you can be joined with another person or even in proximity with another person like, or even be married and the other person not know what's going on with you. So you got to open the doors of communication and say, look, we first got married, I messed up, I did for the wrong reasons, whatever the case is, or maybe they did. Maybe they wanted something totally different out of it. But the foundation was crooked. Hmm? But the foundation wasn't right. If there was no commitment. But if there's commitment, don't think you're going to escape those spirits. Overcome the spirits. Never run from spirits. Overcome them. You've been empowered to do that. But you may only do that one way. You can only do that one way. You know what that is? That's when we are real with the Lord. We cannot, right, get in a situation like that. Try to run away so we can have a better life somewhere else simply because it's not working out. The part you may not know is this. You know what makes the greatest bonds in life? The greatest struggles. The greatest mishaps. In my own personal family, there were some hard spots. It was in those hard spots. We had a family that was forged. Military buddies and everything else is those hard spots. Relationships become unbreakable. I mean unbreakable. There are people I know right now, they don't believe in the Lord the way that I do, but I would put my life on the line for them without, without a thought right now. Right now. Why? Because through hardship, you learn who a person is. That's why. Only hardship can bring that out. When you have two people like that, if they're going through these, this turmoil, it could be an opportunity. If, you're, if you have a heart that is vengeful, full of rage, you'll not see it. So you have to center yourself first. Do you hear me? You got to center yourself first. Now, this is non-abusive. If you're in a non-abusive relationship doing this, you have to center yourself first. You have to see where your heart is in relation with the Lord in truth. You have to discover any brokenness. You're going to have to do that. You got to be prepared. You cannot be sick with a wound and make a decision. You know what the Lord says about a wound that's unhealed? That a wound makes the whole head sick. You know what that means? You're, you're, what you decide is going to be all messed up because you're wounded. If a person is hurt, they're going to make every decision based on hurt. If a person is betrayed, they're going to make every decision based on betrayal. So you have to center yourself first. You have to become sober. Not wounded, sober. You have to accept the conditions. Listen to me. Accept the conditions and say, okay. Okay. Now, Lord, where do I go from here? You have to involve the Lord. I can give you answers all day, give you scenarios all day, but ultimately, you want your answers to come from the Most High. You do not want your answers to come from anybody with flesh. And in the absence of the truth, you can fight. But see, in most cases, when somebody asks me that question, the truth is they don't love that person anymore. They're not willing to fight anymore. When most people ask me that question, they're not willing to fight anymore. The fight is over. They've given up. In truth. In truth. And that happens. Now, in that case, you had to bring that truth to the Most High. Go forward in truth. In truth. Because, take note, 
These steps concern your soul. And if you make a misstep, and there was any, any darkness involved, any strategy involved, the cost is going to be too high. Just taking all bases here. Taking all bases, okay? That's why the apostle said what he said. If you have two people married, one's a believer, the other one is not, and the unbeliever wants to go, then he said, let them go. Let them go. That's what he said, let them go. Somebody said, Mike's Paul, I'm dealing with the spirit that's trying to keep me from having a spouse like an evil, possessive spirit. I really need help because this thing, uh-oh, I missed it. This thing has tried to take over my entire life. Well, if you have, stop for a second. This person I'm dealing with, the spirit that's trying to keep me from having a spouse. Are you married? Are you divorced? What do you mean keeping you from having a spouse? First of all, first of all, listen, you guys know in the Bible, when the Lord was putting people together, you guys remember that? Remember that? He would put people together. In fact, one of them said, okay, well, for the woman you picked out for me, Lord, have this woman bring my horse some water. Go fetch your pail or something like that, right? And so she did that. He wanted to confirm that was one you had for me. In Babylon, people pick their own people. If you want God to prepare somebody for you, if you want what the Lord has for you, then finish your process with the Lord. Do you guys hear me? Finish your process with the Lord. Yes, God can bring you back together. He's the God of reconciliation. That's simple. <laughs> it's very simple. God can also reconcile. He can. He can reconcile. So there we are with that. Right. But about this person, when, it, when, when, when you feel that the devil is trying to keep you from a spouse, I want you to know something. You, people normally will not wait for what God has for them. If you want what God has for you, continue on your course because God is preparing you and somebody else at the same time. And if you are meant for somebody else, he'll bring you together. But listen to me. Once you're complete within yourselves, folks, listen to me. Once you're complete within yourself, once you have found that place of joy within yourself without anybody else, somebody else can come along and compliment the joy within you. That's when it happens. That's when it really happens. If you take note that if you're depressed, you're going to go and find a person who's going to compliment that depression. And what normally happens, if you get together with that person, you will repair from that depression, outgrow it, but the other person is stuck because that's who they are. And then you'll say, oh my goodness, this person is, is, is terrible for me. That's what you're saying. Right? So, so, my answer is, be complete within yourselves. Find the joy of the Lord with you in it. You have to reach that point where it's you and Christ and your joy has returned. Other people are not going to make you happy. Other people can only compliment what's already within you. Regain that joy of the Lord. Start your journey to do that. Somebody will compliment that joy within you, that godly joy within you. Somebody will compliment that. Okay? They will compliment that. All right. I'm not a marriage counselor. What, what do you, have you guys, you guys have lost it. Somebody said, I married under God way too young, knew not Jesus or the Bible, everything was wrong about it, but I was stuck in 25 years. He was on me, passed away in 2005. I lost all respect. Didn't love for him, but I took my vow seriously. You grew. You grew. You grew big time. In fact, 
you were in a situation that caused immaturity in your life, something that takes a person a lifetime to learn, you learned in a very short time. Be thankful for that. Be thankful. No matter what you went through, be thankful. Be thankful. You also demonstrate something, a strength that's very uncommon in this day and age. Remember that. So don't, don't think it's nothing. That was a big deal. It was a big deal. Okay, okay, guys, somebody says, somebody says, what do you think about the people who are speaking on the streets of New York saying Abraham, Moses, and Jesus was not Jews, but Muslims, that the Quran is in the final testament? Oh, people always speak like that. I hear them all the time. All the time. I get emails like that every single day. We have, we have quite a few converts from, you know, Muslim to Christianity through COT. I mean a bunch. We have a bunch. And when I say a bunch, I mean a whole bunch. We have a whole bunch. We have a bunch. One of the issues is, listen, if you get into this tug of war of who's right and who's wrong, right, then you're in a tug of war. I don't enter into that tug of war of who's right and who's wrong. As one person put it, I tend to connect with a person on the inside. They don't understand that. And that caused great curiosity out of them. How can somebody connect with somebody on the inside like that? And how can they continue to do that? To that person, it demonstrated that there was something working outside of words. That's what this person said, outside of words. That made that person curious. And But then this happened with another person and another person and another person and another person. Right. For a lot of them, it says they thought they here's what they said. They said it sounded like you were addressing me, just just me. This is what some of these Muslims were saying. And and it caused correction in them. Right. It caused their natural belief in Christ that was suppressed by culture to surface again. They remembered and then they tended to see it. Right. They said most Christians try to force you to believe what they believe. That's what they said. That was out of their mouth. But they said they didn't hear that from me. They felt that it was almost like I was speaking to them internally. Like a true invitation. Not being forced or anything. Just an invitation. And so that's caused thousands of them to flip, you know, to kind of go over. Now, in this day and age, it's unsafe to mention exactly who they are. But that happens. That happens. So those people speaking on the streets... They're just speaking what they believe, whatever they believe at that moment, right? And they will increase the number. Always remember the time that you live in. You live in a time when Christianity is going to be an offensive, very offensive. I'm telling you, it's going to be, a, there, there will come a day that you, you may, if you were alive in that day and you walk to somebody who's a known Christian and you say, hey, brother, you're going to go to Bible study, they will, sh they will close your mouth for you and say, don't ever ask me that in public. That's what we're coming to. People will be ashamed, ashamed to say that they read the word. People will be offended if you call them a Christian. People will be very rejective of any association with Christ. That day is coming. A real wicked time is coming. Very wicked. If I'm alive in that time, it won't change a thing. I'm not going to force the word down anybody's throat. But the Lord will give you what's necessary to still carry on the work that needs to be carried on without compromise. He will. Somebody says, can you explain the rituals in the Catholic Mass? Actually, you can look those up. It's better for you to look them up and just read through them, right? then for us to go into a total conversation about them. But the answer is yes, I can. But I won't. See, I wondered about Catholicism, and so I read things. I read what was what they were required to read, some of their some of the writers, you know, some of the authors, uh, quite a few different things. And, and it, by reading, it just confirmed what people believe. That's all. But I, I, I encourage you to read it yourself. Just read it. Right? Not for mocking. Don't read it to mock it or anything else, but to understand those who follow that. And then ask your father, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? But be careful, out of curiosity, to go into specific areas of religion 
Be very careful. Make sure that you're rooted and grounded in what you believe right now in the Lord before you drift into any other area. Because a lot of people do that, right? They don't come back for a while. They don't. They eventually come back. They don't come back for a while. So be careful. Always be led to do something like that from the Lord. Right? And always make sure that you have, that you are absolutely sure about your salvation. Unless the Lord instructs you, my advice would be don't, don't do that yet. Don't do it until the Lord instructs you to do it. Right? He may instruct you to do it, and that's going to be based on your calling, whatever you're called to do. But doing things out of curiosity, it seems like it's harmless. I'm telling you now, it can be quite harmful. Quite harmful. So what is it, Ezekiel 13, 17? Who's God talking about? Well, let's go find out. Ezekiel 13, 17. Let me look it up real quick, if you guys don't mind. What time is it anyway? Oh, I'll do that real quick. Ezekiel 13, 17. Let me look that up. Man, I mean, you guys are so incredibly patient. By the way, this other barge that uh, hit in Texas, do you all believe that was happenstance? Right? That, it, you know what's so funny is that, well, it's not funny, but this one had no, it had no cargo. Don't you find that odd? It had no cargo. Now, the last one had cargo, right? The last one had cargo. And I told you guys about those air-conditioned and those those containers. This one had no containers. Did you find that funny? This one had none. Had none. Well, let's look at 13, uh, 13, 17. Likewise, thou set of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them. He's talked to a prophet. That leaves us, this is when God spoke to the prophet. Right? And so the people who speak out of their own spirits are the people who speak what they think things are not necessarily from instruction now where was god going with all this he was talking about the people who continually tell everybody else things are going to get better you know when you hear somebody say well god's gonna god's gonna give you everything and he's gonna give you a mansion and he's gonna give you this and things in the world are gonna get better and all this wealth of the wicked stored up just for you so you can be rich and everybody else can be poor you know the people are promises their ministry is a promise of increase all the time right and so the Lord said they're speaking out of their own spirits and they capture people that don't, that, that, that don't have a grip on a sound doctrine. These are the false prophets who constantly say things are going to get good. When God never told people things were going to get good, he told them things would get worse and worse and worse and worse. He even went so far as to say, and people came alongside those false prophets and daubed up the walls with, with, with some fake substance. In other words, that Religion they have built based on prosperity you had people that came along and helped it along to fortify it. Coming up with different facts to try and make it seem real, like Seven Steps to Prosperity, the book you can buy for twenty nine ninety five. Well, if it's so prosperous, why are you selling it? So we called them false. God said he never said those things. These people speaking out of their own spirits. And they do that to fill their own pockets. That's what he said. And we all know that. We, we know that. We know that. Because every time God sent a prophet to tell anybody anything, he was sending them to give his people a warning and a confirmation of a warning of what he would do. Prophets did not come forward to say, God's going to do a wonderful thing for you. That's not why they came forward. They came forward with a warning. You're slipping up. You're not listening to the most high. When God sent a prophet, because the people did not want to hear what the living God had to say. And so his last resort was to send a prophet among the people in hopes that they would hear. And if they did not hear the prophet, well, then they fell by the penalty that the prophet spoke of. And if you look at the Bible close enough, you're going to see a bunch of warnings in there. God's declaration against his own people and those who followed them that if they continued, continued in sin, things would happen to them. That's what that's for. All right, guys, I'm trying to read your, your questions. And uh, there we are. Somebody says, what about receiving the bread host in the Catholic Church? Does that mean that they're making covenant in the Catholic Church? You have to, listen, when you, if you want to know about Catholicism, 
There are lots of uh, Catholics, ex-Catholics, who probably would not, they wouldn't care to share some insights with you, right? I'm not an ex-Catholic. That's not what I am. I'm not, I'm not that. But there are some who are. They can help you out in some of those more intimate questions. They can tell you about Mass and everything else. But make sure you clarify in the Bible, right? What the Lord was saying first and have a good grip on that before you drift into anything else. Because sometimes, if, you don't, if you're not anchored in the word of truth, you can, you can drift from time to time. This happened to the best of us. It really has. Somebody says, is there a preparation to make for Pentecost? Also, the end of 40 days since the eclipse. You know what? D don't make your preparation before the end of Pentecost, but make your preparations for this very day right now. Treat this day as though it's your last day. I have a tendency to treat every day I'm in as though it's my last day. I do. I do. I do that. That's not, that's not, you know, something automatic at first. It's something that you have to consciously do. You have to consciously do that. But, but listen, when you live each day as though it's your last, that's when your burdens are gone. That's when you truly say, hey, I can't do anything about that, but the Lord can. You'll start walking differently. You also see humanity as precious. And you won't take people for granted. It's the day you have no more enemies. They may call you an enemy, but you're not going to call them an enemy. Notice says, uh, food shortage, the Antichrist comes on the same during after source is pushing that food shortage thing. Not sure of my question. You mentioned something about the size of BPN food. Toxic. What? Well, listen. People have ideas about the Antichrist, but what does the word tell you about the Antichrist? What does it tell you? One of the most standout things in Revelation is this, is that the, dra the world worshiped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. Now, take, take note that the world does not see the dragon, but yet it says the world worshiped the dragon, which gave power to the beast, which means the worship of the dragon has been going on for thousands of years. But how have, have people been worshiping anything of the dragon? His ideologies in the earth. What do you mean? His ideologies in the earth have built nations. There are ideologies in these nations. And you know what? Some of the most abominable things you'll ever see in the word are things that look like the word, but are not the word. Think about that. Think about that. Satan loves to mimic, mock the living God by always having something close to holiness. That leads a person astray big time. And haven't you noticed that if something almost looks holy, people are more prone to follow it and trust it. And will even assign a type of divinity to it, which is a mockery of everything about the living God, isn't it? That's what Satan does. That's, that's exactly what Satan does. Satan will have man assign divinity to man-made things. This is the very thing the living God spoke about and forbade, forbade man to do. Think about that. And then when the beast comes on the scene, they worship the beast, saying who is likened to the beast, who is able to make war with him. They bragged on it. When they say who is likened to the beast, who is able to make war with him, I can almost see a person whose chest is puffed up, and they are so prideful about what they have accomplished. Who is able to make war with us? There is no one like us. We can defeat everybody. Well, don't you hear that a lot? And then, of course, that was the first beast. Then the second beast comes on the scene. Now, which tells you something. Nobody really notices the first two beasts. One is the influence ideology. The other one is a solid set of kingdoms. The third one is the one who is the spokesman and the one who points the world's attention to the first beast. See, it is the this third one, right, or, or this second beast that comes out who has two horns like a lamb, a spake as a dragon. He is the one that made the world worship the first beast. So that means he pointed everybody's attention to the first beast, which means if he had to point everybody's attention to the first beast, why was the world's attention not on the first beast in the first place? 
because this beast that has two horns like a lamb as big as a dragon came out to exemplify the first beast, causing everybody to pay attention to it. And then he said something, that they should make an image to the first beast who had a deadly wound by a sword and had lived, that they should make an image to it. And they did. And then he gave that image life. He gave it the power to kill, to kill as many as would not worship it. So that means when the first beast, when the first beast kingdom came up, people could hardly, hardly recognize it for what it was. The Antichrist is the one that caused the world to recognize the first beast. Do you see that? Though the people of the first beast did brag on it. So the first beast is what? Seven heads and, you know, those horns and the crowns. So it was a set of kingdoms in the earth that people bragged on. A set of kingdoms. People in the hearts right now say, they say the same thing that's said in the Bible. But they don't use the word beast. You know what they say? Who is like my country? Right? There's no one like, nobody can defeat my country. Are they not saying that? Those from Russia say that nobody can defeat Russia. Those from China say nobody can defeat China. Those from America say nobody can defeat America. Those from other countries say the same thing. Isn't that something? And the Lord told us, he gave us the location. Now, I know a lot of people think the seven hills are in Rome, right? I, I don't believe that. I'm sorry. I know it just breaks down certain things. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Because in Revelation 17, it said that the whore sits, right? The, the, the Babylonian woman who does not want, listen, the Babylonian woman that the beast hates. Does the world hate the Vatican? Does the world hate Rome? No, they do not. They love Rome. Or the world does hate another place. See, it's the hate thing. The beast hates the whore and will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. There's a promise in the earth that one place will undergo that. There's also the sewn-in doctrine that took place in the 1200s. But these things we have to cover. Listen, mystery Babylon means hidden Babylon. A place you would never think that was Babylon. That's why it's called Mystery Babylon. You don't know what a mystery is. If it's Mystery Babylon, it's Hidden Babylon. Correct? Now, why Mystery Babylon, written on the forehead of a place, is atop the beast, but does not want to be atop the beast. See, that's what people aren't saying enough. That the beast hates the woman. See, that messes up a lot of earthly ideologies, doesn't it? The beast hates the woman. It hates her. It does not want her to be on top of it. See, in this iconography and pictures that people see, they see a woman with a sword riding on top of bees. That's not the way it is. This beast hates the woman. She hates the woman. The woman has to be the mother of harlots. It cannot be the second harlot. It cannot be the third. It has to be the mother of harlots. The mother, the first Harlot. It has to be the first harlot. The mother of harlots is the first harlot. That's why Mystery Babylon is written on the forehead. Somebody said, well, Babylon's America. No, we're, we're not a mystery. We are not a mystery. We're doing everything in the open. Mystery means all of the iniquitous things are hidden. That means nobody can see the iniquitous things. Lord, have mercy. Nobody can see the iniquitous things. Somebody may say, well, what about the Vatican? Well, people know about the Vatican. They know what's been happening with the priests. They know what's been happening with the policies. People know about that. They don't know about Mystery Babylon. In fact, Mystery Babylon was said to re remain a mystery until she was burnt. It's Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. Now, how do you attract the true seven mountains on which the woman sitteth? My goodness, it's for those who had the first light of wisdom dwell. Not the second light of wisdom, the first light of wisdom. 
It's not what people want to hear. And things probably, uh, to, you know what? In fact, in the Bible, those who thought they knew how Jesus would come to earth, they were dead wrong. They didn't know. They did the same thing people are doing now. They're trying to figure everything out before it happens, and they're not waiting for God to reveal it. Now, some things will be correct, but not all things. We may think we're correct. I, I, I tell you this, man, God already said that the prophets are going to be astonished at how everything unfolds. That's what God said. The prophets are going to wonder. That means they're going to be wrong. Only God's going to be right this time. Everything is not revealed yet. When the Antichrist is revealed, the message will be clear. When the Antichrist is revealed, a few people are not going to know who it is and the rest blind to it. Nope, everybody will know who it is. The entire body of Christ is going to know who it is. You'll all know. It'll be revealed. Now, all people can do now is speculate. In truth, they can speculate. See, when God gives the truth to the body, just like in the word says, he gives nothing in secret anymore. Whatever he gives, he gives to the whole body. Why? If God does not give the truth to all of us, how can any one person speak the truth and any of us agree? We can't agree with anything being said until God puts the same truth in us. We have to be able to confirm the truth. So God will give the truth to the entire body. The revelation will be in the entire body. All of us will know so that when one speaks it, everybody else can say amen. We cannot say amen if we all don't have the same thing. That's why it says that man of perdition is going to be revealed. He will be revealed. I think that our human nature gets in the way. In truth, and, and a lot of people just want to be right before it ever happens. Which is, that's normal. Let's go ahead and face it. That's normal. That's natural. Right? So let's not be two-faced about that. That's just the way we are. We are human sinners saved by grace. Right? So that's the way we are. Some of us have very strong, I have strong ideas. I, I do. I just think most of my ideas are wrong. I do. Unless the Lord gives it to me. Now, if he gives me something, like when I mention certain things, right, that are contrary to probably what you heard, I notice that many of you will go, I did, oh, yes, and then I'll just leave it alone, because that lets me know the Lord put that in you too. It's not that you're learning something new, it's that it confirms on a very deep level, right? Now, when God has, when it is, when it's unmistakable and it's established, we'll move on from that and go to other things, right? But I'll tell you this, what good is knowing anything that's coming? What good is that if I'm not doing something to address some of those spiritual answers that you have for your problems right now? That's why I always revert back to this day. Haven't you noticed? What good is it to know about the future that's going to kill you if you're not prepared for it? What good is it to know the details about everything in the future if, if people still can't bring themselves to repent and truth or they still can't get this or to get that or to make this decision and to overcome that? What good is it to know about any of that if you're going to be spiritually overcome today? People have immediate issues today. We have things we have to prepare for. That right now are worse than the Antichrist. We have things that in your spirit you were born knowing it was real, but no one will confirm it. You know one thing you know what was you've known something you know for a fact there's something in the heavens, there's something in this world operating that is just beyond all man's belief. They come close when they say UFO, but you know that's not quite, that's not the whole thing. You know it's close, but you know that's not the bullseye. You already know that's not the bullseye, but you were born with that knowledge, and you already know it's going to be a problem. Many of you were desperate to find out what that was. Some of you have given up.
on finding the answer. You will need that answer. You will need that discernment. And don't think that discernment is natural. If it were natural, the Bible would never say, be careful to entertain strangers because you entertain angels unaware. Hmm? That means it's beyond your senses. But it's not beyond your spirit. You know there's going to be a massive issue with them. And that's a spiritual bombardment. A spiritual tsunami is coming. And it's going to be worse than any physical tsunami. That will be worse than any nuclear war. That's going to be worse than anything you've ever gone through in your life. And nobody is talking about that, are they? Nobody is talking about that, are they? It will trump every problem anybody ever invented. And who's talking about it? In fact, you already know it's going to be the undoing of just about everything. And nobody is preparing people for it. Are people being spiritually prepared to handle the full manifestation of what will take place? They're still handling things in this conventional realm. They're still worried about, you know, a war that may break out. Who's going to prepare the people for physical, spiritual warfare? Because that's coming. And what defense does man have? None. They have no defense except their placement in Yahshua HaMashiach. That's their only defense. Weapons will not work. It's not going to work. A time will come when all, anybody who bears a weapon will throw it down to the ground and say it's useless. That day is coming too. That's in your Bibles. Why is no one reading that? Hmm? Oh, there's something coming, all right. But that's still to be covered. But before anything is covered in that, people had to be greatly prepared. Somebody says Bitcoin is the CIA sign from a greedy group. That's what Bitcoin is from. Bitcoin now is a coveted system. Believe it or not, the world is working by Bitcoin right now, and people are not aware of that. Let me ask you something. How can anything, how can anything like Bitcoin truly survive in a world where other people have all the keys to the back doors? Think about that. Think about that. Haven't you noticed that things that survive in this world become useful to other folks in power? Hmm? I'll tell you this, so that you don't think that one side in the world is somehow disconnected from the other. If it is not for Christ Jesus, it is not of the Lord. Okay. It doesn't matter if you don't have Bitcoin. You're fine. Nobody has to have Bitcoin. You don't have to have Bitcoin. I don't have Bitcoin. I have zero Bitcoin. None. Zip zero. I have none. There's no problem with that. I have no digital currencies. I study them quite often. I wanted to know how that system worked intimately. Precisely. I found out. So that's satisfying. People have become very rich off that stuff. People who never expected to become rich have become rich. Some people wake up and they're rich from that stuff. That's the truth. That's the truth. But it still operates like other systems. It's a system nonetheless. You learn the patterns in that system. It's almost unfair to enter back into it again, right? I used to be good at stocks. I used to play with stocks a lot. Stocks and a bunch of other things. I was. I was very good at it. I 
I'm forbidden to go back into that. By morals, I won't do it. Okay. So right now, right? I have my uh I have my two accounts. I have I'm good. I'm good to go. I keep a small, if not invisible, digital footprint. But I know how those systems work. Somebody says, Brother Mike, it's a tentacle question. How can I learn coding as fast as possible? Well, uh, there are two books you can learn. You're going to need one extra because of AI. You will have to know one extra. Java, of course, or, or I'm sorry, C++, believe it or not, is a must. That's a must for COT. You have to know C++. Okay, that's one. There are two other programming languages that you have to know. I prefer people to have a grip on Python because it's a growing universal language that will be in everything. Right? So I prefer people to know Python. I do. So if you can learn those two, you're going to have a jump start because we have a neural net here, right? And that neural net uses both, both, both. It uses one, two, three, about three programming languages. There are several layers, right? And uh, each language is important on the, the same architecture. Same architecture. Somebody says, as in Snake, Python is a language. They just named a language whatever they thought was clever. So that's what they refer to it as. Like the snake. Just like the snake. Learn those two and you, uh, you'll be able to assist. You will. Folks, and I, I hope you guys backed up your systems, I do. Did some of you guys see the Windows warning that came out this morning? Any of you guys see that? There was a warning that came out with Windows. More and more people are going to see it. It, it kind of messed some people up. Right. Somebody says, Mike, if the banks crash and we have to go digital, do you think will we have our debts held against us? Or No, they won't. There's another system coming out, guys. Listen, I, I'm telling you right now, the, now don't quote me on this. I'm just telling you something, something that, that uh, I'm just telling you something. They're not going to hold anybody by their finances. They did not do that. Why would they have to hold you when they already got you? Listen, you, you can't operate with money, right? They already got you. They don't need to have anything over your head. They already have you. Trust me. They already have you. Right now, as, as, as one of the big wigs said to me one time, they're letting the children play. And playtime is almost over. Why do you guys think that everybody in Revelation was blindsided by what happened and overtaken and thought the beast kingdom was so beautiful a thing. Hmm? Hmm? Somebody said, are you watching who? That's another article from Watchman 88 says, Mike, are you following GameStop short squeeze? Well, you know what, that guy, there was the same, this happened before with the same gentleman who spoke, and the stocks did the same thing. Stocks are based off people's feelings. It is stock market and digital currency. If people feel positive about something, they're going to invest the numbers go up, right? If they start feeling negative about something, they're going to take their money out, and the trend goes straight down to the ground. That's what it's based off of. So every single news report, statement, uh, that TikTok stuff, social media is going to affect stocks, is going to affect crypto. It does every single time. It's that it, whether it goes up or down is not based off legitimate things. It's just not. A person can go broke off somebody else's feelings. Elon Musk, for example. I remember a long time ago, he spoke, he said something about a, a Dogecoin. And some people became rich in less than about three days because he said that. Then he spoke something that wasn't quite for it, and some people lost everything in one night because of what he said behind Dogecoin. That's the way it works. 
So when people feel shifty, uh, they t- you know it goes down. And if you don't follow that stuff, right? You you I guess you have some people that are long term. And so what they do is they just whether it goes up or down, they just keep the same amount in there. And if it if if it if the average grows, they grow with it, and that's what they're looking for. Some people try to get rich overnight. They always make the same mistake. I will say this, just in case some Christians are involved. When you see something going up, don't ever invest in it. Never. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's how a lot of people go broke. Never become emotional behind that stuff. But I'll, I'll give you a warning. I, listen, there's a barrier with me. Right? Uh, there's just a barrier with me. Let's put it that way. Because that would be just so incredibly unfair. Thievery is what it would be. That'd be thievery. Guys, I'm going to say God bless you. Somebody says, so would try to repossess our houses if we owe money. Nobody owns a house. Nobody owns a house. (laughs) When when people bought their homes, when you buy your homes, right? I hate to say this, but when people buy their homes, they agree to not own their houses. There's a legal term. You don't own that house. There's a legal term, but you don't own it. And at any given time, this whole country can turn certain clauses over, right? They don't need to do a thing. Would they do that just to do it? No, no. Are they going to just, you know, make some people suffer and some not? No, they're going to let people duke it out. They're going to let people fight it out just like the Bible says. Men will cause damage in the earth at first. Men will fight men, right? But then the Lord intervenes, not with goodness, but he's pleading with fire, smoke, and brimstone. Then the curses go to work. Then everything happens beyond mankind, and they still won't repent. And then the punishments come. The wrath of God will come. And they still won't do anything. And then their influence is locked away for a thousand years and all of a sudden they're peaceful again. And then when that thousand years is expired, they're evil again. That demonstrates something. If a person and people can go for a thousand years without doing any vicious thing and all of a sudden Satan is loosed and he goes out and deceives the inhabitants of the earth again, then those people, listen, the Lord said, the Lord told us that a man is drawn away and tempted of his own lust. Anybody with darkness in them, in the absence of anything that tempt them in darkness, they're, they're going to be good. But as soon as something dark rises again, they can also be tempted. It's like the major second chance they were given to demonstrate to them that they were truly corrupted. Like God said they were. God is not going to condemn a person who thinks they're innocent. Not one person, not one person who is judged guilty will think they're innocent. Not one. They're going to know exactly who they are. They're going to know that they know where they come from. See, not everybody you're talking to is of the spirit of the Lord. There are two groups of people on this earth. Two types of spirit you deal with those born of God and those who are not born of God. Those born of God will always go back to God. Those not born of God are trying to do everything. They may not even know they're not born of God, but one thing is for sure, they don't like Christ. They don't. They don't love him. They're found among us, but they don't respect the Lord like we do. They don't love him nor need him like we do. They are of a different nature. They are. They try to do everything to wreck God's word among us. Try to make us go against each other. It's what they do. Try to make us argue. They sow doctrines that are full of falsehoods. Clouds without water, they're called. Twice plucked up by the roots. Twice dead. Spots in our feasts of charity. And Enoch spoke about them. He did. Yes, they love to fight. They embrace the argument and justify judgment. They do.
So it says, how do you intercede? What exactly does one pray? How are you covering? Pray, but don't can I ever have the Lord speaking always. What can be done only if the sinning spouse is the one that wants to leave what's committed? Just like what the single friends could do. It says, feel terribly convicted, wants to proceed with enjoying the world. That's when you, listen, in that predicament, that's when you pursue Christ out of the freedom and love of your heart. Have no expectations for anybody. Focus your life right now on Christ. Seek, listen, understand the time you're in. You guys are in a time when, in a very short length of time, all your problems are going to be minuscule compared to what will take place. That all the ones that would not hear you will seek to find you. Just like the Bible says, a day would come when people would search for the righteous and they wouldn't find them. They're going to be looking for the word of God. They will. That time is coming quick. Many of you are being challenged in different areas of life. First and foremost, don't operate by what you feel, by the flesh, when it comes to negativity. Understand that when any, any demonic assault or any assault period is against you, you're always going to feel like God didn't hear anything you said. If you so much as shed a tear, your father's aware of it. If you blink, your father's aware of the state of your eyelashes. Whatever you do in secret, whatever you do in public, whatever you do, period. Your father's aware of it. Don't ever feel like the Lord is not hearing you. The Lord hears everything about you, even your internal cry. He feels the state of your heart and knows the state of your heart. And Jesus, because he suffered just like man on this earth, is not without compassion to respond to your concerns, your hurts and worries and fears. He already knows it. He is not like man that he should lie. And he's the one that wrote these things. So you better believe he knows the entire state of you. Let your request be your request. Let him know that you're seeking him. And most importantly, let him know how you feel. Let him know. When's the last time anybody went to the Lord and said, Lord, I, I just don't feel like you can, I, I don't feel like you're answering me. I feel like I don't matter. Did you tell the Lord that? Are you true? That's being truthful with him. And our father loves truth. Do you know that? He loves truth. So in that truth, approach him. Approach him. You've been given that passage to boldly go to the throne of grace to find help in a time of need. You don't have to formulate what you're going to say. Just tell him. Tell him, open up to him, open up to him, and then you'll see, oh, you'll see, Father, open up their eyes to your doings, now that they have requested, I thank you, Lord, that you'll do exactly what you said you'll do. Folks. We're going to continue in our preparations and everything else. I had to restart everything. While you weren't looking, I just messed everything up. You guys, listen, make sure that your systems are backed up, please. Please. Please, please, please. And you guys in these flood zones, watch your local weather. And these storms are different, right? Even tonight, seven inches was dropped on a place that didn't expect any rain for the next, what, 10, 10 or 12 days. So um, make sure you're at least aware of the weather. I'm going to help you guys out with the weather, too. I'm going to do my best to make sure these maps reflect your personal areas. So we're going to try and consolidate and bring that, distribute that stuff to you guys. Okay? We're going to do as much as we can do to help you guys out in every single area of concern that we can think of dealing with this. All right? So that's where we are with that. Admins, uh, in our new page, which will uh, one of them should post tomorrow night, well, while I'm talking to Pastor Ball, you guys should be exploring the new page. 
leave me a message there. Okay, the message system, that's what I want you to try it out. Leave me a message in that thing. You guys have some things to uh, test before we distribute that out to others. We're going to do it here at COT first. All right. It is one of our main systems, right? So you guys get to test that out. Hopefully it works okay. Not too many bugs. So I can fix it right after I uh, talk to Pastor Paul and uh, we can get that deployed. Okay. That's going to open up a whole new set of management opportunities and get our admins in place to open up the rest of the chat rooms on a very strong and lengthy level. Folks, I thank God for you. Listen, employ me, right? We're going to, and, and, and somehow, admins, you got to collect some recommendations from folks. Oh, recommendations on backup devices. I had one, but you're not going to, well, the one recommendation I had, it failed me today. Are you kidding? I had a recommendation for a backup device, and my own backup device failed today. So it's no longer a recommendation. It's not. And believe me, I put things through their paces. I do. I put everything through its paces. Everything I use hardware-wise, it works pretty hard. Um, so I'll come up with another. I have an alternative, but we'll see how it does, okay? I'm putting fast-tracking it through some conditions, and we'll see how it comes out on the other end. All right? With that, I'm going to say God bless you guys.